Common Room Radio. I'm Sarah Kate Pizan, and can we put the bickering on hold till after we survive the massive space battle? I'm Alistair Stevens, and one minute you think someone has a weird-shaped head, the next minute you realize part of that head is a hat. That's why you don't like hats. <laughs> I am Groot! What did he say? He said I'm Vinton Bang. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Excelsior, a super-powered podcast. This week, in case it wasn't abundantly obvious, we're talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Oh. I came unprepared. I, was, I thought we were talking about a different movie. Oh, shut up. I know for a fact that you have 10,000 words of notes. Well, I haven't done the word count, but you're probably right. <laughs> okay, wait, I can do that right now. Vince writes that. us a novel in notes every week. It's only 3,100 words of notes. Oh, okay, all right. But 31, it is color-coded. It is color-coded, yes. <laughs> Vinton works harder on this podcast than I ever worked in any amount of school my entire Entire life. Yeah, I have had jobs that I haven't worked this Oh, time. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I really like talking about comics, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little about Guardians Volume 2. We should probably, I guess, talk first about Guardians Volume 1. Yeah. Do we love it? Do we hate it? Is it our kind of movie? I really enjoy Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 and 2. Uh, I think that they're a lot of fun. I feel like they don't require a whole lot of brain power, and I can really just like sort of check out of reality even more so than with just your regular <laughs> run-of-the-mill MCU film and just let things happen to me visually and auditorially. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you were a fan of Guardians 1? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was definitely a fan. I was really anticipating it when they got announced because I had been following this team of Guardians since they first appeared in the comics as a team, not yeah. in their solos because that's way further back than I existed. But as a team, I had been following it and I loved the stories that came out of what they were doing with that. And so when they announced it, I was like, I'm so here for this. Mm -hmm. And knowing them from the comics, I could never have expected the movie to have gone the way it did. Yeah. But I'm so pleased with it. Like, yeah. it, it's changed the team in such a way to make it even more pleasing to me. It was like, <laughs> oh, well, Vinton's going to love this team, but we can make him love it more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they just made it to the light me. Yeah. Rocket Raccoon might actually be my favorite character in the entirety of the wow. MCU. It's just that I don't get to scream about him quite as much as I get to scream about the Scarlet Witch. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, Rocket Raccoon. I am Rocket Raccoon. I am Rocket Raccoon. He's toned down a little bit for the movies. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of his that he would say randomly while shooting and killing people was, Blam murdered. <laughs> and he would just That's shoot guns and kill people left and right in the comics. So it's toned down just a little. I using that. Blam, murdered. <laughs> I'm going to get that tattooed somewhere on my body. I really like the first Guardians, too. I, Guardians was one of those movies that the more I thought about it, the less I liked it. It mm -hmm. became like more problematic the more I thought about it because there sure. are some real issues about you know representation in that movie and in the way that we both motivate female characters and use female characters to motivate the male characters. Mm -hmm. It's not that good. Mm. But then... I watched the movie again. Mm -hmm. I was reminded, oh no, this is just really fun. Yeah. It's so just much fun. Yes. So energetic, yeah. so exuberant, so genuinely funny. Mm -hmm. The soundtrack in the first volume, at least, is is just fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, was, I listened to it over and over again after it Yeah, no, me too, me too. <laughs> so I was really excited for Guardians 2. I was, as people who listened to the uh, mini-sode that we did on the Thor Ragnarok trailer will mm -hmm. remember, I was a little concerned about Guardians 2 because I was fearful that it was going to be more of the same, that it was basically going to be a retread of the first movie. Yes. It super wasn't that. It totally wasn't that, yeah. It 100% mm -hmm. wasn't that. Yeah. And I'm really thrilled that yeah. we took these characters in so many different directions. Mm -hmm. I could see people saying that it was that, but I really think what it did was take everything that you loved about the first movie and then amplified it and did it in new ways to make you love it more. So it wasn't like just doing it again. Yeah. It was finding no. new ways to do those same things that you love and making you love them more. Oh, and for sure. Exploring new character dynamics. I mm -hmm. mean, the Guardians as a team are basically apart from most of the action of the movie. We're yes. getting these individual stories instead, which works really well for me, particularly of course, because most of, if not all of those sub stories are about family. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. About real family, about found family, about bonds of loyalty, all of that stuff. I love how we even explore that with, with Yondu and, and his storyline. It just really, really worked for me. So I am, and that is not to say that it isn't, again, a little problematic in its use of female characters. We're still yep. not <laughs> quite there. I think it's better than the first movie in that regard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are still some problems that we'll get into as we'll break it down. So, Vinton, you've read a lot of Guardians comics. Yeah. I've never read a Guardians comic in my life. I'm not 
terribly into Marvel Cosmic. Mm. It's never been like the area. I haven't been either historically. Yeah. So this is really Guardians is what got me there. And I was going to bring it up a little bit later in my notes, but I'll I'll just jump ahead now. If you want to read Guardians, start with Annihilation Conquest. It was a uh, event that Marvel did in 2006, seven or eight, somewhere Mm -hmm. in there. It lasted kind of long, but the Guardians were formed in that and had their first uh, title with this team launching out of yeah. that, continuing out of that. Okay. It, it, it start. It launched that the Guardians team, and it launched the Nova title at that mm-hmm. time, and, and it kept telling that story mm-hmm. for the next couple of years, I mm-hmm. think. Well, this Guardians team, yes, was this Guardians team. Conquest, I will talk about yes. the old Guardians team <laughs> when we get to one of our end credit scenes that yeah. actually shows them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's so much in this movie that speaks to the history of Marvel Cosmic. There There's really so is. much Jack Kirby in this movie, which yeah. is amazing, yeah. and most of it is recontextualized I mean I could never have expected going in that we would get Ego the Living Planet and Celestials kind of no. slammed into each other and Ego wasn't even owned by Marvel for the for cinematic purposes mm-hmm. they had to make really? a deal because James Gunn wanted Ego to be star Lord's father because he's not in the comics and mm-hmm. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well but he wanted to be his father in the film and they didn't have the rights so Marvel had to deal with Fox to get it because he was so part of the Fantastic, the, yeah, Fantastic Four. So why does Fox own the rights to... Because of the Fantastic Four. Oh. Fantastic Four came with a lot of the cosmic stuff. Because oh, Because they I dealt see. so much with that and the Silver Surfer and Galactus and sure, all this. Sure, okay. So they owned it, but they were able to make a deal because Fox wanted to have free reign, creative reign, over Negasonic Teenage Warhead and Deadpool. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they were able to change that character and do what they wanted with her power set-wise mm-hmm. and personality-wise by giving ego to Marvel. Okay. And they're like, we're not going to use Ego. Well, yeah, <laughs> How could you no. possibly do that? You guys you can't, you can take Ego and fail luck. with your movie. <laughs> I just want to think for a second about that meeting. Because <laughs> that was some boardroom in New York City where 20 high-priced lawyers sat down and said, no, no, no. We need Ego. We'll give you Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Is that, is that cool? Can we do that? <laughs> like someone went to law school for like 15 years <laughs> to be able to say that sentence. Yeah. Someone billed at $500 an hour yes. to say Negasonic what, Teenage so Warhead. What's so weird about it too is that they own Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Fox does yeah. for mm-hmm. cinematic purposes. They just can't make changes to her under mm-hmm. the agreement from Marvel. So they would have had to show her just like in the comics. And But they were like, we don't want that. We want right. to just use the name yeah. and make her someone else. I'm like, why, why, why is this a good deal? Do you just pick a different character? <laughs> Character or a different Make name. Up your own ex person. I guess Jeez. they just didn't care about ego that much. Wow, I yeah. think that well, neither of these characters, let's face it, is a particularly high profile six yeah. and six character. <laughs> I never, ever, like you said, thought I would see a live action ego. <laughs> well, and I thought that it worked really well. I mean, yeah. 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 Yeah, I thought I, that they did a really great job with that. Uh, the, all of the uh, storylines that we go through and we visit um, and just everything. I mean, you know, because we're dealing with the Sovereign also and also Celestials and also Ego the Living Planet and also Howard the Duck shows up again. And also there's a group of Watchers and also Stan Lee is there and is a spaceman <laughs> and just it all really worked for me. Yep. Yep. It really, really did. And I have to talk about Kurt Russell, I yes. guess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Kurt Russell has just eclipsed Robert Redford as my favorite performance from someone that I expected to be not very good in a Marvel movie. Wow. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Not I could see my that. favorite performance. No, sure, no. sure. But in terms of the delta between my expectation and <laughs> yeah. what I got, <laughs> yeah. I thought Kurt Russell was fantastic. He was amazing. Yeah. He yeah. did a great yeah. job. Mm-hmm. And I did not have high expectations for no. Kurt Russell in this film. So I'm thrilled, thrilled that he was as good as he was in this movie. <laughs> So some random facts before we start diving through the story. One of the things that I found out when reading about this that I really enjoyed is that Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt had said that reading the, through this script actually helped him come to terms with the death of his own father. Oh, wow. And I think that really wow. speaks to something this movie can do in, in, in talking about found family and talking about loss and talking about the way that found family works in general. Mm-hmm. I think it can be uh, therapeutic in, in a certain way mm-hmm. to see these type of stories being played out where you have such hurt and such loss and such uh, found family. I yeah. can't think of another way to say it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's it's really great in that. And I'm really uh, glad to hear that it did, have an, it did have an effect on even the actors that played yeah. those roles. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's really fantastic. One of the other gems that I found was that since Groot only communicates by saying, I'm Groot, uh, Vin Diesel, who does the voice for Groot, was given a version of the script where all of Groot's lines were translated into English. Oh, so he could brilliant. then look at them and decide the best way to say, I am Groot, to mean that. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's so great. I don't know if it's true of Guardians Volume 2, but I remember reading that for Guardians Volume 1, Vin Diesel actually recorded all of the international versions yeah. of yeah. I Am Groot. Mm-hmm. He would just translate that. I, I love that. I hope that that's true of Volume 2. Mm-hmm. As yeah, well. me too. That'd be great. Did Baby Groot work for you guys? Uh, 
Uh, Baby Groot worked the least for me, oh, I think, out of okay. all of the characters that we had on screen. Uh, well, no, I also didn't like, I wasn't like super duper into Mantis. Like you could, I could have given or taken Mantis, yep. frankly. We can yep. have some talks about that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but like in our big opening sequence, which first of all, I really enjoyed the opening sequence of this film where uh, when we are in the middle of the space battle, we've got the Guardians fighting that giant slug monster who wants to eat up the batteries that uh, belong yep. to the Sovereign, right? Um, and the fact that like, we're focused. At, like I, I enjoyed the fact that we were not focusing very much on the fight, and that we were instead like panning away from that, and all of this was just happening in the background, and all this. But I didn't super love that we just watched Baby Groot dance for that entire opening section. See, I love that. I super loved it so okay. much, and, and I was worried so I wouldn't because mm-hmm. I was kind of getting tired of Baby Groot being like the star of the yeah. first yes, film. Yeah, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. and it's like he's like in five seconds of the end of the movie, guys. Why is he the right. breakout star of this right. film that everyone's in love with and wants the action figure of? But uh, yeah, he, he won me over again. Yeah, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. He's super cute, and all the conversations that he has with Rocket, I love. Yeah. I love with all my heart and soul. It was just that I, <laughs> while I really enjoyed the concept and and I guess most of the execution of that beginning scene where it's like, well, we're gonna have this big space fight, but not really. You're not. Actually, you're not you're gonna not, see it. You're not gonna yeah. see it. And I really like that uh, conceptually. I think that it's really interesting and really neat to do yeah. that. Um, but yeah, after about a minute and a half of Baby Groot dancing around, I was like, okay, all right, well, let's let's move along. So, like we're we're here for what, a thing. I like so much about that wasn't Baby Groot himself it was the introduction that we got to each of the Guardians and the yes. way that they interact with yeah. him now that yeah. I did like yeah. yeah like whenever Gamora's like Groot get out of the way you're gonna get hurt and he's just waving at her and she's like hi <laughs> <laughs> yeah back to fighting and then when uh, Drax falls on the stereo and he punch and Groot punches him yeah, more so like beating him <laughs> up <laughs> um, this or was... even the moment and I'm surprised that I like this because I, I like you Vinton grew tired of the Baby Groot meme after Guardians 1 yeah but the moment when he is dancing and Drax lands behind him and he freezes in exactly the same way as he does from the end credit sequence in one. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was just super cute. I was really surprised yeah. that yeah. I liked Baby yeah. Groot as much as I did. This was one of the uh, few opening sequences that we have, like opening credit sequences we have in a, in a Marvel movie. This doesn't yeah. happen very often. And one of the things I really liked about it was it's great use of 3D. I love 3D movies, mm-hmm. uh, but usually it's not done that well. Yeah. I, yeah. Just, I just happen to love it, so I see them anyways. But <laughs> here I think it was done really well in this opening scene. They really made good use of the depth with showing Groot and the, and the things in the background. And yeah, it was really yeah. well done mm-hmm. with the 3D there. Yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, I think Guardians is better served by 3D than maybe any of the other Marvel movies. Basically, we're yeah. we're not striving toward any kind of naturalism. Yes. We're not right, trying exactly. to depict yeah. things that, that we That is the thing know. with 3D. Yeah, yeah, and you can definitely, I mean, because we are literally in space, you can actually like make use of the 3D where it's like, no, here's this thing in the foreground and then yeah. everything way back there, like you actually are giving this illusion of depth, yeah. which is, I mean, like you just said, far more impressive than in... I don't know, Civil War, Winter Soldier, sure. take your pick. Yeah, it's just not as good in those. Yeah. So two last facts real quick. One of them makes me sad here. Uh-oh. Uh, James Gunn and Kevin Feige both wanted David Bowie to appear in this film, but he died just before they could oh. actually make that happen. <sighs> My heart. He would have been and so And I really want to know what they were going to have do, done with him here because it would have been perfect in this film. Yeah. It would have been amazing. Yeah. And then... Uh, Laura Haddock, who plays Meredith Quill, uh, Star-Lord's mother, also appeared in Captain America the First Avenger as a fan of Captain America. And I really want them to know prize out of the way in the film somewhere where they have a reason for her, her being way back there in time. Or maybe a descendant even. You can just say, yeah, that's hmm. actually uh, Star-Lord's great-great-grandmother or Ooh. something. Well, probably not great-great. I mean, it was only... Well, yeah, I don't she know. Was, she was... T- I, time. Her in this I don't understand time. No, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, George is the MCU. Yeah, I mean, there's really no way that she's 40 at the beginning of this movie, right? I mean, <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, maybe just grandma. Okay. <laughs> so let's dive in uh, talking about this film. First of all, the time setting, it's set in 2014, mm-hmm. which puts Wait, it. Wait, really? Yeah, because yeah. it's just three months after the first film, which puts it a year after Thor the Dark World and either before or after, just around the same time as The Winter Soldier. Huh. And a year before Age of Ultron. Yeah. Well, okay, wow, that's so weird. Okay, so Ultron hasn't happened within the context On of Earth. this film. No, Ultron hasn't happened yet. That's so weird. But that gives us a huge canvas to tell stories with the Guardians before we get to Infinity yeah. War, which I think is really yeah, interesting. Yeah, and James Gunn had said that this movie was not going to set up Infinity yeah. War, but they're yeah. going to be in it, so I wonder what they're going to do with that intermediate time there. When, okay, obviously they're going to make a Guardians 3. When is that supposed to happen? Is that going to be coming out? Okay, they, have a, it, they have announced it will happen, but because the movie just came out, there's no Is it no going to come out after dates. Infinity War, but Most take likely, place prior before. to <laughs> Infinity War? Okay, Maybe? listen, Marvel, you are getting super wonky 
wonky with your time. I, I, I mean, like, I'm into it. That's cool. You know, you do you. I mean, I wonder if the Captain Marvel movie is going to be somehow connected to the Guardians. I mean, Carol can be a space hero, too. Also, I yeah. have seen comics in which Captain Marvel and Rocket Raccoon hang out and pal around and do a buddy cop sure, thing, yep, which sure. now I didn't realize I want that as bad as I do, but I definitely want to see Brie Larson <laughs> and Rocket Raccoon running around solving yeah. space crime. I want that. Though with the closing scene of this movie with the the last post credit sequence, and I'm just jumping way the hell ahead here, the introduction of Adam Warlock, we're clearly just going to do more cosmic stories with the Guardians. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can't take Adam Warlock to Earth in the MCU, right? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. We'll get there. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> I'm assuming it's involved Adam Warlock, and that will come. Excellent. <laughs> so, Sometimes Vinton and I just have a side conversation here in the podcast about what it is. And Sarah just drinks. Adam Warlock that time. also <laughs> is a big part of the Annihilation Conquest series that yeah. you should read. It's great. Okay. If you want any more of this in the comic form. I do. So... Let's jump right into the film. Speaking of uh, Marvel and this crazy time stuff, we start in Missouri, 1980. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meredith Quill is riding in a car listening to music with Kurt Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Although he's not Kurt Russell. But, with the yeah. most amazing <laughs> 80s hair I think I've ever yeah. seen in my life. <laughs> that same weird digital de-aging that they did with Robert Downey Jr., right? But I think mm -hmm. they did it better here than they have ever before. Way better. And I think it was mostly due to camera tricks. They put aviators on them and shot him from weird angles at yeah. the sides and from behind a lot because yeah. they didn't want to show too much. Right. Okay, I, that makes it sense. It worked very well. It worked, yeah. yeah. It didn't yeah. throw me out of the movie the way that de-aged Robert Downey Jr. threw me well, out of the movie. Yeah, like, that was just the weirdest uncanny valley moment ever. It's like, <laughs> what, <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> but Kurt Russell is playing who... Meredith Quill calls her spaceman. Mm. They go behind a Dairy Queen and in the woods, the spaceman shows her a small alien plant and tells her that eventually they will be all over the place. And he then kisses her and we zoom 34 years into the future. I really like this. I really like it because it is completely essential to the plot. This is, in a sense, the inciting incident for Ego's plan for mm -hmm. his for his plot. Uh, it works really well. It's incredibly charming. Yeah. One of the weird things about the 3D in this movie is that when we are on Earth... Everything looks slightly tilt shifted mm -hmm. so that everything looks like a toy from a distance. Yeah. yeah. Everything seems as though you know, when you're getting that, that beautiful tracking shot of the car coming through the Missouri yeah. countryside right mm -hmm. up front, it feels like that car is, you know, a Hot Wheels car. Yes. Until we get really, really close to it. But I thought that it really worked. And of course, we're immediately introduced to the soundtrack. What do you guys think of the Guardians Volume 2 soundtrack compared to the first movie? I would say not as iconic, but just as enjoyable. That's exactly where I am with it too. It doesn't have the big hits mm -hmm. that you think of from from Guardians Volume One, but because they've kind of stepped back from that, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel so much like a jukebox musical. It feels more like yes. a soundtrack that's been put together for this movie. Yes, yeah, yeah uh, I think that I agree with that as well. Um, yeah, I certainly knew more of the songs that were in the first film than sure. versus like the songs that were in this mm. one. But yeah, they, it did seem that uh, they were a little more purposeful in their music choices, like mm -hmm. from scene to scene. Yeah, I also really like that a lot of the music from the soundtrack here is used practically in fiction in the film. That yeah. it's playing from a stereo or something, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate when movies do that. Yeah. It really gets my heart. Yeah, that <laughs> use of yeah diegetic sound. I particularly like when uh, Rocket and Yondu are yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looking for copies of Quill's music. <laughs> <laughs> they know that they need a soundtrack to kick in. <laughs> yep, <laughs> they've grown accustomed. Yeah. To <laughs> Star Lord has has. has it left his print on them. Yeah. <laughs> so 34 years later, here in the great future of the year 2014. <laughs> <laughs> Which was three years ago. Shit, guys. The Guardians of the Galaxy, we have Star-Lord, Gamera, Drax, Rocket Raccoon, and Baby Groot are on the job to secure these batteries for these people called the Sovereigns. Mm -hmm. um, and an obelisk descends. Mm -hmm. This is a creature that looks like a creature from the comics that's called uh, the Mini Angled Ones from a place called the Cancerverse, which is another big thing with the Annihilation that happens uh, yeah. as in those comics, so check it out. But basically Cthulhu monsters. <laughs> lots of mouths, yeah. lots of tentacles, lots of yeah. teeth. The Guardians Guardians attack and Groot dances to Mr. Blue Sky, playing <laughs> practically in the film on that little stereo that he mm -hmm. tries to plug in at the beginning. Uh, Drax falls on the speaker. Groot fights him for it. <laughs> Drax thinks that the creature's skin is too thick and jumps into its mouth to attack it from the inside. And I really like that that's a thing that happens in movies. I feel yeah. like that has been brought up in fiction very often. And Starla sure. points out, 
That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> the skin's just as thick on the inside <laughs> as it is the outside. Yes, yes, yes. And if you're inside the creature, piercing its skin is not the worst thing that you can do to that creature. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just start so. spinning in a circle, you guys. It'll be fine. <laughs> but the rest of the Guardians do manage to slice open the creature, and Drax comes spilling out. <laughs> this is a great introduction to the Guardians, to the way that they work together, to the visual language of the movie, the visual mm-hmm. spectacle of the movie. Can I say how much I love the, the gunshot effect? from Star-Lord's blasters in oh, this. Yeah. It looks completely different than it did in the first movie, but it looks fantastic. Mm-hmm. This is like kinetic laser effects. I just love the physicality of it all. Yeah. Even in this this super CGI'd space. Yeah. You guys, I have a problem with Guardians too. I don't love Drax. Mm. I don't like Drax. I got super bored anytime we did a Drax bit. And I don't think that's Dave Bautista's fault. Mm-hmm. I think he's good with the material that he's given and clearly his physicality is, you know... Impressive and super intimidating, but <laughs> I kind of feel like he is the one for me that didn't move on from his characterization in the first movie. Mm-hmm. It's still he's doing the Guardians yeah. one version of of Drax again. Am I out of step with you? Guys I can on definitely this? see that. I enjoyed him, and my thought on it was that there was this fine line that where you take a joke and you cross it, and it it goes from being a funny joke to ruining something in the movie, Mm -hmm. like making something less in the movie, making a dramatic part less or making the joke just cheesy and overdoing something. And I think that with Drax specifically, this is what, where I always go to with this. Uh, when I talk about the film here is that, with him, he went right up to that line for me, but never crossed it. So it was right there. And I was like, on the edge of my seat going, oh, no, don't make this cheesy. Don't ruin this moment. Yeah. I was like, okay, they stopped. Good. And so yeah. I always went up to that line. And I got so close, it scared me, but never crossed it for me. <laughs> right. But I could totally see how other people... I mean, it's, it was so close that slight personality difference and you would think yeah. it crossed it by right, a large amount. Right. So, <laughs> Though, honestly, it wasn't even crossing the line. I just found the drag stuff to be pretty predictable. It's yeah. just, it, I, I just want more complexity from that character. Mm-hmm. Like any more complexity right. would be fine. Sarah, how did you feel about Drax? Um... He was fine. Yeah, uh, I I wish that I wish that we could have gotten a chance to go see this movie again because this is actually one of the very very rare instances in which uh, all three of us got to sit down and watch this movie together, yeah, like in theaters. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was our friend Lily's birthday, and so mm-hmm. what she wanted for her birthday was to go out and see this movie. And uh, yeah, so I wish that we had a chance to see it just one more time, but. Um, Again, I remember Drax being fine. I mean, yeah, he is mostly doing, like, the thing that, like, Drax did in the first film. But I wonder if that's part of, because, like, his people don't understand, you know, like, metaphor or anything. They take everything literally. So maybe they just are not really creatures of change very much. Maybe they just kind of, like, are pretty static. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. I, I can see the justification for the character, and clearly he was very popular, and being in the theater watching mm-hmm. this movie, hearing the laugh responses from the crowd was was really good. And when you say laugh responses from the crowd, do you actually mean the laugh responses from me? Because I was the loudest person in that theater. You were the loudest <laughs> person in that theater, mm-hmm. which I loved. What I loved, too, was that there were a couple of super nerdy jokes in the movie where you were the only one laughing <laughs> at that volume. <laughs> I was sitting right next to Vinton and something would happen and we'd go, huh, that's a clever movie. We like that. And you would shriek laughter from the end of the row. Yeah. <laughs> Great. It, it I love that. <laughs> it was fantastic. I would, anytime there was a good joke, I would look at both you and Alistair and go, did they think that was as funny as I did? <laughs> Confirmation from my friends. <laughs> I am terrible in movie theaters. I don't talk through movies, but I emote loudly and often <laughs> to the We're shock go and of see everyone. Every Marvel movie together from now on. Okay, good. Like, yeah. have to. Superhero movie. Because we should say, I, this is to tangent completely away from Guardians Volume 2. Mm-hmm. They had the perfect curated list yeah. of trailers right before the movie. <laughs> they really Vin- did. Yeah, yeah, they did. yeah, yeah it was no, it was all directly into yes. your heart. So great. <laughs> we had Thor Ragnarok, we had yep. Spider Man Homecoming, yep. we had The Last Jedi, and then what was the oh the <laughs> was, Pirates of the Yeah, Caribbean. they ruined it. They just went they right off track. They were like, we've prepared him for this. Here's this awful one you're gonna hate. It. Yeah, <laughs> Wonder Woman looks amazing. Yeah, I'm Wonder still Woman. more excited for that movie I, than I ever yeah. have been. It comes out next month, right? Next yeah, month? yeah yep. like three weeks from now or oh something. Oh my gosh! Spider Man Homecoming looks incredible. Yes. The new trailer looks yeah. very, very good. Yes, I'm yes, into yes, that yes, very yes, much. Yes, yes. Star Wars: The Last Jedi, of course, not strictly speaking a superhero movie, but I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. they use superpowers. Oh, they yeah. use a superpowered film. Sure. Yeah. A yeah. lot yeah. of that films. Uh, Extended universes in comic books. It counts. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Nailed it. I'll take it. It's we'll our show. Cover we that can do what we want. Yeah. We probably won't be talking about the new Pirates of the Caribbean movie, you guys. Probably. If we do, it's because someone gave us a lot of money to yeah. specifically Oh, yeah. If you give me enough thing. money, I'll yeah. do that. Give us enough money. Patreon.com slash Common Room Radio. And we will talk about the Pirates take, of the Caribbean yeah. movie. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so, not sorry. well about it. Back to the movie. <laughs> so, the Guardians complete their mission and meet with the High Priestess Aisha. 
who's the high priestess of the sovereigns, yeah. and they hand over Gamera's sister Nebula as payment so that the Guardians can collect the bounty for her. Aisha talks about Starler being only half human, and we get our hint for what this movie's mm-hmm. going to be about here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We found out that Rocket stole some of these batteries they were supposed to be protecting, <laughs> and a fleet of sovereign drones come after the group as they depart. Star-Lord and Rocket fight over who's the better pilot and almost <laughs> wreck the ship doing so, <laughs> trying to get to a wormhole to escape. The attacking fleet is all destroyed by a man riding on the ship and waving at them. <laughs> the Guardians crash land on the near planet. <laughs> yes. It's a really great sequence. It's a yeah, very, the, very good the sequence. The moment when Kurt Russell comes riding by on their ship, just, it's, hey. I was just like, wait, did Douglas Adams write this movie? <laughs> what just happened? That was very Hitchhikers <laughs> in the Galaxy. <laughs> Can, can, we, can, can we rewind a little bit to talk about the Sovereign? Yes. 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 Good Lord. A lot of golden-skinned people. A lot yeah. of super attractive yeah. golden-skinned people. I don't know. I think that the golden skin really took away from the attractiveness for me personally. Really? Yes. If you were in a bar, Aisha wouldn't draw your eye, like, at all? Well, I mean, of course she's going to draw my <laughs> eye. She's drawing in all of the light of the room, literally. I mean, geez, but I would take one look at that woman and be like, uh... She would kill me, and not like in a sexy way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please list the characters in this movie that would kill you in a sexy way. In this movie, yes. Gamora, okay. Nebula. <laughs> uh, probably not Nebula. She might be really practical about it. Uh, let's see. Uh, just stepping outside of this film, Black Widow. Um, <laughs> it's the same universe. Mockingbird. Uh, you, have a, you have a list. It's uh, just, good. Scarlet it's Witch. Good. Jessica Jones. <laughs> Jessica Jones. Yep. Again, might be a little more practical than sexy. Well, uh, but maybe, maybe a little. Yeah, yeah just a yeah. smidge. <laughs> <laughs> so Aisha is a character in the comics and I'm not going to dive into what she's really about because there's not much time here and we have a lot of other characters to dive into and she's yeah. not that big of a deal in the comics. She's mostly related to Adam Warlock who we will dive into when we get toward the end. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So the man who saved them lands on the planet that they crash land on as well and reveals himself to be Ego, Star-Lord's father. With him is his empathic assistant, Mantis. In the comics, Star-Lord's father is actually Jason of Spartex, Emperor of the Spartoi Empire, but not here. So let's just move past that. Yes. <laughs> he's okay. all, he's yeah. an alien that rules an yeah. empire. Neat. Cool. Ego, the living planet, first appeared in Thor number 132, September 1966, and was created by Stanley and Jack Kirby. In the comics, he is usually depicted as a planet with a face, seen briefly yep. in the film, mm-hmm. nice which I really appreciated yeah. that we got to see Kirby that briefly. Ego's abilities include warp speed travel, uh, complete control over his own mass, allowing him to adjust size, uh, terrain, or create constructs like tentacles or human-like entities to attack people. <laughs> he can make himself look like a paradise to attract or less welcoming to keep people away. Mm-hmm. He can absorb living things, heat up his own core to temperatures to eliminate intruders, and has some psionic powers. Also, his inner workings look quite similar to how a normal, li- normal living organisms do. He has uh, veins and organs and a brain and arteries and the, all these things, just like a normal person inside this planet. <laughs> can he move around? Yeah, he can yeah. light speed oh, travel or like warp zoom? speed travel okay. through space. Yep, so he sometimes will come to Earth to talk to heroes and the- do things. All right, yeah, cool. uh, He's usually depicted as a villain, but not always. He has a really complicated backstory and history in the comics that's convoluted because yeah. comics and we don't have time to dive into that because it would take a whole two episode series just to even touch the surface. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Yeah. Patreon.com so, slash <laughs> comic room radio. Mantis first appeared in the Avengers number one, 12 June, 1973 drawn by Don Heck, co-creator of Iron Man mm-hmm. and created by writer Steven, uh, Steve Englehart. The character followed its creators moving from Marvel to DC to Eclipse to Image and finally back to Marvel again <laughs> because they just took that character wherever they wanted wait, and slightly wait, wait, changed wait, her. Wait, 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 wait. Was she the same character in... Yes, Ev- as a matter so- of fact, she referenced things that were going on with her in the Marvel Universe that kept going on when she came back. Yes. So, okay, so, so what you're telling me is that... Every comic universe is intertwined because of the character Mantis. Um, huh. I don't know about because, but yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go with it. <laughs> there are other reasons. I mean, there have been crossovers between Marvel and DC. They, yeah, they but, Mantis, glam, so. okay, but Mantis is the original crossover. Uh, maybe not the original, but definitely. No, this is my belief. It's the thread that holds it all together. Crossover, yeah. <laughs> it was only, I, think, I mean, you weren't allowed to do that. If you created a character for Marvel, no. that character belonged to no. Marvel. If you sure. created a character yep. for DC, that character belonged to DC. Nobody cared about Mantis, you guys. Yep. And, and I think they slightly changed her. I think they would give her different names, but keep her looking the yeah. same and doing the same thing that she was doing when you last saw her. <laughs> so she just, she just moved to Metropolis so, yeah. and just like yep. changed her identity is what she did. In the comics, she's human and trained to be a grandmaster in martial arts. And gained green skin that she is known for, uh, changed in the movie, and other powers through crazy space pregnancy and other shenanigans with the Kree. No time. What? The, the Kree. But I have so many <laughs> no, the answer is the Kree. 
We agree. <laughs> in the comics, she can also manipulate plant life, astral project herself, and heal herself. Good power set, Mantis. <laughs> I I guess they already figured it, figured that they had enough uh, ass kicking women in uh, uh, Gamora and didn't need another one, so they changed her here for the the film. I hope that she gets to show off her martial arts in the next one because that's something I really liked about her in the comics. Mm-hmm. Is she was a great fighter. Yeah. Uh, James Gunn said specifically that he chose to make her an alien in the film because he wanted Star Lord to be the only human from mm-hmm. Earth mm-hmm. so they can which focus on that which absolutely I, I, works. I totally agree yeah, with that that's, yeah, that's that a good idea yes. I mean, she's known for being green and having antennae in the comics so saying that she's human is just going to give you a lot to explain yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah what I love about this about how careful James Gunn is being about this is that I'm so hopeful for the Guardians Captain Marvel crossover yeah because if the first human that Star-Lord interacts with is Carol Danvers. That would be amazing. It would be magnificent. So I'm, I'm hopeful for that. I don't know if we're going to see that, but it would be pretty good. Maybe it's already happened, and that's how Peter Quill learned the phrase trash panda. <laughs> I like to think he just has Netflix. <laughs> space Netflix. <laughs> space, 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 you have space to add the word Netflix. space to everything. I'm sorry. No, I, you're right. I've read Jack Kirby comics. I know that. He has the cosmic nullifier Netflix. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Elsewhere, Yondu is with his Ravagers. Howard the Duck is also there. <laughs> which I, On the I prostitution love. planet, which yeah, is called... Ro- robot uh, prostitutes, I guess. They, okay. slipped, they slipped robot prostitutes into a, a, a Disney film? Uh, yep, they sure did. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the Ravagers and also Howard the Duck are all hanging out on the planet Contraxia, which is disgusting. That's a, <laughs> It's a gross name for your planet. Yep. You the, did a bad job. Or maybe you, I mean, like it's what it says on the tin. It's yeah, exactly yeah, there. Well, you come here, you but, will contract all of them. But they're robots. Would you? And how often are the robots clean? That's an excellent question. I would hope <laughs> that these robots had some kind of self-cleaning mechanism. In their defense, the planet Contraxia is taken from the 616 universe. It actually has nothing to do with robot yes. prostitutes. It's just a really minor name. I think that James Gunn just found it yep. in a database somewhere and wanted to use it because it sounded dirty. <laughs> it's like, hey, he looked at it, he went, I have an ah. idea for this uh, planet. <laughs> yep. This is the first moment at which this movie took a sidestep for me because I feel like in Guardians 1, they would have just been alien prostitutes. And I know that robot prostitutes are not that much better than alien prostitutes in terms of the depiction of women because they're still, you know, super feminine versions of these these robots. Yeah. But it feels for the first time as though this movie has an awareness of some of the problems, some of the, the problematic depictions of women from the first movie and is is taking some steps to address them. So. Well, I mean, it would have been nice if they had shown like some, some boy prostitute robots. I think that as fans of Firefly, we're all... Big fans of boy prostitutes, too. Yes. <laughs> Look, they got boy boards. <laughs> so Yondu sees Stakar Agord, played by Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. This is Rocky. another character, along with Yondu, from the original Guardians of the Galaxy that were created in the 1960s. We'll get to that again when I get to that end credit scene. But yeah, how did Sylvester Stallone get yeah. work for did you guys? Did you guys know that he was in this movie? I did. I don't think you, I, I didn't did. know what role he was going to be playing, but I knew he was going to be in it. I had no idea that he was in this movie. It was <laughs> such a surprise. I was I was surprised in part by how glad I was to see Sylvester Stallone on a movie <laughs> screen again. It felt really good. Super reminded me of Judge Dredd, but apart yeah, from that, yeah. I thought he was great and a really welcome addition. Yeah. Well, and uh, Michael Rooker and Sylvester Stallone get to rehash their friendship from the movie Cliffhanger yep. that they were in together <laughs> back in 1993. Okay. <laughs> how much do you love Michael Rooker in this movie? I a love lot. Michael a lot, Rooker a lot, a lot in general, lot. but a lot in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always find him to be a watchable actor, always an engaging actor. Yeah. I mm-hmm. really like him. He seems like a perfect match yeah. for, for the Guardians. I'm universe. so glad that he became more of a central character in this film. I did not know how that was going to play out when I heard that was happening. Yeah. I was worried. And when I saw it, I was like, I'm really glad that yeah. came out yes. that way. Yeah. Me too. Mm-hmm. Apparently, Stakar had exiled Yondu from the Ravager team for um, child trafficking. Mm-hmm which he did with Star-Lord and possibly some others. Yeah. One of Yondu's team, Taserface, questions oh, wow. Yondu's leadership with Kraglin. That's the Sean Gunn character yes. from the last movie, played by James Gunn's brother, mm-hmm. also of Gilmore Girls fame. Kirk from Gilmore Girls, yes. <laughs> huh. I like to think they're just the same character. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so Yondu kidnaps Kirk from Star's Hollow. We should say, too, that Sean Gunn also plays Rocket Raccoon. Because when yes, they're shooting, the he is the rocket stand-in, yeah. physically. Oh, that's awesome. Is, yeah. Did you know, is he for the second film? I knew he yes, was for no, the first I, one. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. For the second film, too. <laughs> I, I did uh, also learn that they made a life-size puppet of Groot to have as a stand-in when they were filming things. Since it was just baby Groot, they figured they could do that. And just yeah. had the puppet and the guy oh, that made awesome. it like, run around with it, I guess. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So Stakar shames Yondu and leaves. Then the Sovereigns arrive, and Aisha has a job for Yondu. 
this is our introduction to basically our primary subplot in the movie, which is Yondu's story and is immediately rooted in these ideas of family, of, mm-hmm. of loyalty, this, this crew that he has assembled, this kind of family within the context of a larger family, which works really beautifully to see yeah. him exile and, and to get that great line from Stallone. You might think that I take pleasure in exiling you. You broke our hearts. Yeah. That this is immediately emotionally connected for trafficking in children, mm-hmm. you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yondu is not a good guy. Yeah. But it works just beautifully for me. And then the right. introduction of, of Aisha and her... her uh, <laughs> Rolling out her the red court, carpet across the snow. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the jokes that lasted a little too long for me. Like, yeah. as soon as they started rolling that out, I immediately was like, I know where this joke is going. This is the next minute of my life. This is the next... This is fine. This that is was another one of those things that half. also felt very Douglas Adams to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah still very. You're right. And I also have some comic backstory on Taserface, but I'll get to that when Rocket makes fun of him later. <laughs> Back with Ego, he explains to Star-Lord that he sent Yondu to pick Star-Lord up after his mother had died. He invites Star-Lord and his group to his planet. Star-Lord is hesitant until Gamora convinces him to go. Star-Lord, Gamora, and Drax go. Rocket and Groot stay behind to fix the ship and keep an eye on Nebula. And the way that Rocket fixes the ship is just basically grabs a giant can of spray paint and is like, yeah, that's it's just like how you fix the ship. Yeah, it's like a spray 3D printer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. I thought it was great, yeah. Why would you take Drax with you? I don't know. <laughs> if Nebula gets loose, what are Rocket and Groot going to is do? It, Rocket, okay, I, Rocket maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, be Groot fair. Baby Groot is absolutely, go- which, I mean, he does, but Baby Groot is going to accidentally release Nebula. So yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a dumb choice. Yeah. To be Gamora fair, he does and Peter can take care of themselves. They I don't they need can. drags. You're right. Yes. On Ego's ship, Mantis shows off her powers, revealing Star-Lord's feelings for Gamora. Mm-hmm. And that scene that we've saw a million times in the trailer. That's the one? Yep. yep. It's, it's exactly that scene. It plays out exactly as you know that it will. Yes. It's then funny we, the first time. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Then we cut back to the crash site, and many Ravagers start depending, descending upon the crash site. And... Rocket makes quick work of all of them, showing his prowess in I traps love and weapons. This scene, I really love so good. Yeah, I yeah. really, really loved seeing like how capable Rocket is. It, yeah. it filled me with joy. Yeah, I was yeah. so you happy. You see, like he set traps, and you're like, yeah, of course he set traps, but he's still down on the ship working. But then you quickly realize that's a recording. He's in the trees, stealthily waiting. He yeah. knew this was coming. It's like, oh, Rocket, you're a genius. This yes. is so great. Yes. It's really, really good. <laughs> And the inventiveness of the traps, too. That anti-gravity yeah. trap thing. Yes. <laughs> he just slams them back at the ground over and over like in car boys. That's exactly like, <laughs> that was exactly the reference I thought. If yes. you had been sitting closer to me, I would have nudged you and said, Rocket, this changes everything. <laughs> and I would have yelled, Nick! <laughs> and Rocket looks like he's winning until Yandu sneaks up on him with his whistle arrow. And... Mm holds it up in front of his face. Yandu reveals that uh, they got paid to capture them and, and return them over mm-hmm. for stealing the batteries. But Yandu reveals that he wasn't going to turn over Star-Lord against a number of his crew's wishes. Mm-hmm. Kraglin speaks up against Yandu, even though he is kind of a loyalist. In this moment, he says, I can't be quiet about this any longer. Yeah. You're making bad decisions. And then Nebula breaks Yandu's Mohawk fin piece and knocks him out. Siding with the rebelling Ravagers and taking Groot and Rocket into custody on their ship. How do you guys like Nebula in this movie? This is Karen Gillan, we should say, better known to us all as Amy Pond. Amy Pond. Yeah. I do love Amy Pond, and I quite enjoy Karen Gillan. Um, I think I liked Nebula pretty okay. I mean, yeah. she was really capable. Uh, I I think that I enjoyed the scenes that she was in, you know that she was in. Um, I like uh, her whole vengeance plot. I I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I think she worked pretty well for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah, I liked her way more than in the first film. I didn't care much for her. That's yeah. Yeah. And here, I think she's capable and, and she has motivation. And mm-hmm. I really liked her backstory a lot. Yeah. But they didn't get the chance to do too much with her, even though she is a driving force of the film. Right. Yeah, I feel as though this version of Nebula is all but incompatible with the version of Nebula that we got in the first movie where because yeah. she basically makes that choice at the end of the movie where she's never going to to have any kind of rapprochement with Gamora at all right and yet here it seems like that's a much more organic part of her character it's only yeah. been three months you guys yeah for real but I like this version of Nebula so much more that I'm definitely willing to just accept right. it and and seeing her out from under the shadow of Ronan the Accuser is great yeah. and giving Karen Gillan a chance to act yeah. Also pretty great. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. She's a good little actress. She's yeah. not bad, it turns yeah. out. <laughs> not half bad, that Amelia Pond. 
So Ego and crew land on his planet. As he explains, he's a celestial and his consciousness is the core of the planet. He came up with a human form to explore the galaxy and fell in love with Star-Lord's mom on Earth. But he had to return to his planet to replenish his energy. I've used that excuse so many times. Yeah. Sorry, darling, I have to go. My planet needs me. <laughs> Star-Lord still struggles with Ego leaving his mom to die. Ego shows Star-Lord that he possesses some of the same power as Ego and shows him how to make an energy ball and the two play catch. Okay, so I have never read comics before. Um, that's not true. I've never read any Garland <laughs> comics before. Uh, so when this happened in the film... I was certain that Ego was, like, tricking him because the others weren't around to, like, see this happen with mm -hmm. Peter and Ego. And I was like, oh, no, this is all a total lie. He's totally faking oh, it. Oh, interesting. He's a super bad, bad man. You could still think that if you read the comics because in the comics, wow. while Star-Lord is half alien, half human, his alien father might as well be human. He's just oh, from yeah, an alien yeah. race and an empire. It, uh, he's not, like, super powerful celestial. Okay, okay, <laughs> no. all right. So Peter Quill doesn't actually have any, no. like, superpowers. No. Okay. And certainly not any more because of reasons yeah question mark <laughs> that the death of ego at the end of the movie destroys his pet that's how genetics work right when you DNA, kill my yes. dad yes. like i also everything die that, yes everything that you inherited from your dad you lose all that oh man yeah you just become a genetic clone of your mother at that point <laughs> oh god we'll get there <laughs> please let's not get there <laughs> Back on the Ravager ship, Taserface has become captain in the mutiny, and his crew expels many Yondu loyalists into space. Kraglin watches as his friends are killed. In the comics, Taserface came from a planet inhabited by primitive beings. One day, a cache of armor and technology created by Tony Stark wound up on their planet. The inhabitants quickly adapted themselves to the new technology, calling themselves the Stark after their idol, and proceeded to misuse their newfound gift to conquer other planets. This is where Taserface comes from in the comics. <laughs> In I have the, never read that story. I kind of want to read that they story. Are the the start. They are the exact opposite of Wanda and Pietro's story in Age of Ultron. <laughs> <laughs> That's yep. amazing. It's fantastic. So let's talk about Taserface. Let's talk about Rocket <laughs> teasing Taserface. Yeah, th this name. is where we get Taserface boasting and yeah. Rocket making fun of his name, and it's so good. I like that James Gunn switched the story, because this isn't the way it is in the comics, that Taserface gave himself his name and was yeah. like, yeah, this is a great name. And yeah, it's so good. It's genius Bradley Cooper is fantastic. Yes. I thought he was great in Guardians 1. Obviously, Rocket was one of the breakout mm -hmm. characters from Guardians 1. His performance in this movie is so much sharper and more acute and more nuanced and more broad yeah. than it was in Guardians 1. I just think he's terrific. And it doesn't hurt that the CGI for Rocket is now just extraordinary. It look, yeah. yeah, no, like the CGI on Rocket is amazing. I mean, like you never you never really forget, okay, this is a CGI character, but like it doesn't stick out to you, yeah. which is really, really nice. Yeah, I love this whole sequence. I love any any time that Rocket gets to be a little bit of a jackass, I'm in. I yeah. love it. <laughs> he's saying what we're all thinking. Yeah. What kind of name is Taserface? <laughs> <laughs> but this type of antagonizing would lead Taserface to kill Rocket, except Nebula steps in and stops Taserface from killing both Yondu and Rocket, suggesting that they turn them in for their bounties and collect the money instead. And she demands a new hand and a ship so that she can go find Gamora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we get that really funny scene with uh, Kraglin <laughs> trying to show her to the ship. And she's like, what are you going to do with your money? And she's like, I'm going to go kill my father. He's like, I thought you'd get a pretty necklace or something. <laughs> okay. Which is sexist, first of all, Kraglin. Don't be sexist. <laughs> are you going to look at a blue cybernetic chick and be like, oh, I thought you were going to get a pretty necklace? No, no, no. I'm going to hesitate for a second and say, I love Sean Gunn in this movie. Yeah. What you said earlier about Drax, that he keeps going up to that line, mm -hmm. but never crosses it. That is exactly how I feel about Kraglin. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. I constantly I that feel that. Yeah. I stop, and then they stop. And it's really good. I, I just, yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, seeing him interact with, with Nebula. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed seeing him interact with Nebula, but yeah, I mean, just the, I mean, like, it would have worked better for me if she'd have been like, I'm going to go and kill my father, blah, blah, blah. And he just goes, Okay, cool. And like, yeah, it just, yeah. well, bye. I, 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 I do like off. backs away. Yeah, that would have worked so much more for me than this. Oh, I thought you were going to get jewelry. I do yeah. like the, the joke there because he is coming from a, basically a pirate ship of uneducated people. And he knows that's nothing true, about yeah. feminism. Or, <laughs> like, he has a certain vision of what, what women are. And that's not at all the truth because sure, he's been sure, traveling yeah, yeah. on a pirate ship with, with a gr gross uneducated men for most of his life. Yeah. I think it's completely <laughs> defensible in the context for exactly that reason. But hey, it's another nod to Guardians and it's somewhat yep. less than progressive yeah. politics. Yeah, yeah. 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 You get, like, I mean, you can still do the joke. Like I said, like you, the, the way that you fix that joke is you just have Craig just go, 
good luck, well, and then just walk off. You can have Craiglin make exactly the same joke, except not make the subject of the joke gendered in any way. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you might yeah. buy new boots. I thought you might buy a new gun, even. Yeah, yeah that's true. It, that's true. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. uniquely feminine thing yeah. for, for, uh, for Nebula. We're about to get to the scene where Mantis and Drax begin to form their friendship. Mantis is a problematic character, you guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't love the way that this character is used. I don't love that she is another female character in the Guardians of the Galaxy universe who is basically defined by torment and, and defined by... And by being owned by being a, a man. Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And we highlight that with her even less than we did with Gamora in the first movie, even less than we did with Nebula. And that's like foundational to Nebula's character. Yeah. In, yeah. In that's like Nebula's like whole deal. That's her whole deal. And yeah. we give almost no attention to it. I didn't like Mantis. She made me, uh, it, that's not fair. I actually really liked Mantis yeah. at certain points, but she made me super uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes it a little bit worse because Mantis is such a capable character in the comics. Yeah. So for me watching it, I was like, oh, what did you do to Mantis? Why did right. you do well, this to and her? <laughs> oh, and we made her empathic because that's what women are. And she is empathic in the comics as sure. well. But that, that's all they left her. Yeah. They right. took everything else away from her. Yeah. And I mean, she's also basically just a child like she's yeah. basically yes. a little girl and i don't like that either i don't like no there are elements of manic pixie dream girl about her there yeah and also of... yeah it's just yeah i i don't know you, you could have made her badass you didn't need to not make her badass because listen your film will never suffer from having more badass women that's very true yeah, yeah. And I will say that if anything ever got close to crossing the line for me, it was the joke that kept coming up of Drax telling her she's ugly. I really and I was like, I don't, that. can you stop doing that, please? And then he finally almost made up for it and said, you're beautiful on the inside. And I kind of liked that. I was like, okay, I yeah, kind of, but still that's I, almost saying the same thing I again. I appreciate that <laughs> from a like, okay, you really stuck to the joke. Like yeah. you yeah, just, yeah. You, you landed that. That's great. Yeah. From, from, from like a, a narrative, perspective, literary, yeah, yes, craft perspective. I can respect the construction of that joke. Yeah. Don't do that joke. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. But I do like... I, I do really like, aside from those comments, the friendship that was being formed between Drax and Mantis yeah. and that they were yeah. there for each other and that they did form that quick bond. And I, I do want to see more growth in that as mm-hmm. we continue yeah. on in this mm-hmm. film series. I, I hope that she's going to be a regular. I hope that she's going to come back for, for Guardians 3 yeah. for whatever their involvement is in Infinity War. I think you're absolutely right that, yes, the commentary from, Jax, uh, from Drax on her appearance it felt a little like nagging, honestly. It felt a little yeah. like he was he was being a pickup artist, like MRA guy throughout this. Right, and right. Just <laughs> not not loving that yeah. at all. Yeah. Particularly because in other parts of the movie, we have Drax kind of pushing back against the ridiculous kind of, of human and human adjacent perspectives on sex and relationships. Right. He's the one who tells the story. You know, he tells the story of his conception. Or, yes. Or he tells the story of how his father told the story yeah. of his conception yeah, yeah, yeah. every winter solstice. You humans have hangups. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. That's a Drax that I can get behind. That's yes. a Drax that I, I want in the movie where he sees through the, the performance and the pretense of, mm-hmm. of human social interaction. Yeah. But this, yeah, just a little, a little uncomfortable for me. Yeah. yeah. And I do see some of what they're doing because they want Drax to have this certain type of personality where he's really naive and he doesn't understand a lot of things and he just says whatever he thinks and he comes from a certain race where women are a certain way and she's not at all that way so that's why he finds her to be unattractive right but instead of going oh you're not my type of uh, my cup of tea says you're hideous and he's just because he doesn't know any yeah. better to say any different that's but exactly it. it's still feels uncomfortable the way they did it right yeah. <laughs> yeah and so it's just like the other thing we were talking about these things can be explained away but still could have been done better right yeah, and there's a, a weight of evidence against yeah. guardians it, much much less than guardians one i wasn't bothered by this movie the way that i was by guardians one but right. there is still there's a streak of, of just unpleasantness right at its heart when it comes to dealing with its female characters mm-hmm. yeah so here mantis starts to tell drax something very important but gamera interrupts them and mantis changes her mind which also isn't great because it's now we're just super great. really casting Gamora as the bitch. Yeah, which is unnecessary. Completely we don't need to do that. Like, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Because this is the second beat. We didn't mention Gamora interrupting the scene that we all saw in the trailer <laughs> where, uh, oh, right. where Mantis reveals uh, Peter's feelings for Gamora. That, mm-hmm. that, you know, it's just another beat here where these two women are set in opposition, the one with the other, for literally no reason Literally whatsoever. no reason. Yeah, there's no yeah. reason. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. The I mean, I guess... 
there would be people who would argue, oh, well, Gamora doesn't really trust her, just like she doesn't really trust Ego. And it's but just like, fine. well, I mean, the, uh... Gamora's the one who argued Peter into going right. to this exactly. planet in the first yeah, place. Yeah. And you yeah. don't get to have her take both sides of the yeah. argument right. when you need her to. I think it was maybe an overplaying of her seriousness because she's supposed to be this warrior woman who's focused on the goal on, all the time and mm-hmm. she doesn't have time for the goofing off that Drax and Star Lord and other people do. Right. But here it was played unusually uh, uneven. Right. With this, well, and she also character. did say hi to Baby Groot during the opening scene. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> because I, I, I assume she softened up a bit. <laughs> How could you not if I'll you're living too, with baby group? I've watched this movie once. I might watch it again, or, or I will watch it again. And when I do, my position on some of these issues might soften. This is only how the movie struck me the first time. Right, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes there is textual stuff. And mine might get even movie. harder because <laughs> I'm usually not much of a critic the first time. Through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's usually the way that I am as well. Usually the first time I see something, I'm like, no, it's perfect. And there's zero problems whatsoever. And then later I watch it. I'm so like, maybe I shouldn't rewatch because yeah, I feel like yeah, yeah, no, it'll ever be, right. forever be my perfect soft angel baby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Ravagers lock up Rocket and Yondu, but leave out Groot for their own entertainment. Which and is it's terrible, and I hate them. terrible and sad, and I hate them. Yes. <laughs> yes, not great. Rocket and Yondu share a moment. Yondu talks about how Stakar saved him from Kree slavery, and Rocket asks why Yondu kept Star-Lord, and he insists it was because he was small and could fit in the places that others couldn't. Mm-hmm. Right, and we get a couple of reiterations of that through yeah. the course of the movie. We're hinting already at, at Yondu's, I don't know human heart at his kindness toward Peter, yeah. which is really great. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, me too. The two decide to work together to break out and try to get Groot to bring Yondu his other fin. <laughs> Groot brings numerous wrong items, including a mechanical eye, which fulfills Rocket's practical joke wish from the first movie, <laughs> wanting the Ravager's eye that he didn't get. And finally, Kraglin comes back with Groot and the fin, apologizing to Yondu for his part in starting the mutiny. I didn't mean to do a mutiny. <laughs> they killed cute. all my friends. I love this sequence. Yeah. yeah. This is so funny. This is such a great use of Groot. Yes. Yeah. And it, it lasts forever, but is one of these sequences that just keeps getting funnier and funnier <laughs> yes, for me. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one that went right up to that line for me, too. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, if they do one more, it's going to be too Yeah, much. yeah, I know you're still waiting. You're like, oh, okay. It was great. <laughs> And I loved okay. Kraglin here, and I loved him before when uh, they're sending the people out into space. It got really emotional for yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Like the look on his face. He did such great acting here. That Just the emotions that he showed mm-hmm. yeah. when this was happening. I was like, oh, this is so perfect. And when he comes back and apologizes, I'm like, oh, I feel this. Yeah. I feel this mm-hmm. so much. This is Fantastic. So the bigger fin here that he gets uh, actually resembles a lot more closely his character from the comics. In the comics, he has a big mohawk yeah, yeah. fin. Uh, so I, I'm really glad that they found a way to make that work and put that in there and make him look a little bit more like the comic yeah, character, good. practically, in the yeah. film. And then they escape from their cell, and Yondu proceeds to kill almost every Ravager on the ship. Yep. Mm-hmm. And th- there's a lot of killing going here, and it's played as a joke, uh-huh. and I don't know if it works for me or not. It works for me. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the rampant murder, and I'm not a fan at this point of Yondu's magical whistling arrow, mm, yeah. because it just feels like it's overpowered. It, it does. I, like, I will agree with that. If I was running this as a D&D game, I would have to nerf that arrow so hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The fact that he can control it without... Uh, being in the same room with it. They can control it through the yes. cameras and yes. all sorts of things. That it's, is a little, little bit OP, but I mean, whenever they're like walking along the catwalk and you just see the guys like falling down this music's play, <laughs> it absolutely worked for me. I don't know. I love, <laughs> like, I love rampant, unnecessary yeah. violence. <laughs> Not gore necessarily. Like I don't need like rampant, unnecessary gore, but I mean like these dudes are just falling yeah. to their deaths. What and, and this is where we get cute group getting angry and running and attacking and yes, it's, it's pretty yes, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say that the music and the tone own set in this scene made me want to laugh and made me want to enjoy it a lot. Mm -hmm. But then I kept going, he's killing a lot of people. Am I supposed to be like a huge fan of this? And I was just like, I was, I had like an inner struggle going on. Right, right. Yeah, this is why in the mainstream MCU movies, we use robots and we use, you know. Chitauri. Chitauri, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because then you can kill indiscriminately and we don't worry about it so much. But these guys are basically human beings and they are being murdered outright. And there are like a hundred of them. That's okay, they're jerks. They are jerks. They are jerks that killed (laughs) his his side of the crew. Yes. Um, They tortured baby Groot. They all deserved it. They were down for killing him. Mm-hmm. True. Um, sure. So that can be argued, but it's still there's still those moral questions that it comes nah, not some for me. <laughs> <laughs> no more. We'll have flaws to go here. comic books and keep moving. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yondu, Groot, Rocket, and Kraglin escape on a part of the ship that disconnects, and Yondu blows up the rest of the ship as they do so. Taserface notifies Aisha where Yondu was heading just before he dies, and the four go through 700 weird jumps to get to Ego's planet. <laughs> 
I want to talk about Aisha delivering the button to the taser face joke, <laughs> which is just great. <laughs> Again, this movie just, it, it lands its jokes perfectly. I, I was into that a mm-hmm. lot. 700 weird jumps to get to Ego gives us our Stan Lee cameo in this movie. Yep. Oh, man. <laughs> which yeah. is the most meta Stan Lee cameo that we've had today and, and possibly the most meta Stan Lee cameo imaginable. Yeah. Yeah. It is the one that ties all Stan Lee cameos ever together. Yeah. Yeah. Because he talks he about being this a FedEx guy, ago, right? right? He says, I was the FedEx guy. And that calls right back to Civil War. Yeah. And he's with the Watchers. And wait, 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 wait. Civil War hasn't happened yet. Ooh. This is a very good question. Time and relative space. It's super timey Yeah. Okay. No. All maybe, right. Maybe no, he's like, been a FedEx guy before, and he goes back to be a FedEx guy. Again and no, later. no, no. Stanley just is a watcher. He's like just a super oh, no. old yeah, this watcher is, this is that theory. like they have. He is like forgotten, um, and now is this shriveled old Earth man. In in the uh, credits, he is credited as watcher informant. Mm-hmm. Oh. So my thought is he was somehow a human or, or some kind of humanoid being plucked up by the watchers to be an informant for them as they watch everything to be part of the action. And that's why he always finds himself in the middle of the action of all of these big events. Yes. Whether he's paying attention or not, he's not very good at informant because oh. half the time in those scenes, he's looking the other way or doing, distracted by something. Middle of the action? Question mark. Working as a guard at the Smithsonian when someone steals Captain America's That's outfit. true. I'm thinking more like Drinking the Spider-Man things that happen when he's like in the middle of a fight or something. Well, and does exist across multiverses. Or Doctor multiverses. Strange on the yes, bus. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's pretty good. It's it's a really deep cut joke. And yeah. again, super Kirby because we're getting the watchers here, which works really well. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The watchers in the comics are these supreme beings who watch everything that happens in the great multiverse, but aren't allowed to interact except for earth's watcher. You ought to, who often does. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I have a very rules. important question about the watchers. Do they have a council? I, I think so. Good. So. Watchers councils are important. Is there one girl in all the world who they watch over? It's it's uh, Stan Lee. <laughs> Stan Lee is the slayer. Stan Lee is Done. the slayer. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> also in these 700 jumps, we see some fighting Cronins. And these are rock people who we, we have seen previously in Thor The Dark World, where Thor smashed one of them, leading yeah. the army, just destroyed right the, that right rock Right at the beginning of, of Dark World, yeah. But particularly one famous one from the comics, Krog, is going to be playing a role in Thor Ragnarok, and he's actually going to be played by uh, the director of the film. Excellent. So uh, nice. it'll be interesting to see, because he's a, he's a big part of the uh, Planet Hulk storyline in the mm-hmm. comics, so it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see what they do with him in the movie, especially Excellent. since the director's playing him. Huh. So a little tease there <laughs> for that. It did feel as we were going through jump after jump after jump that this could be just... I, I, Pretty sure that we will look back on this sequence in exactly the same way as we looked back on the Winter Soldier montage mm-hmm. from Winter Soldier and realize, oh, oh, Marvel just told us everything. Yes. yes. They just gave yes. us everything. I'm sure there are Easter eggs contained within this sequence yeah. for things that we haven't yet seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on Ego's planet, Star-Lord hits on Gamora, but she does not reciprocate, and then she leaves. And when she leaves, Nebula comes down on her ship shooting at Gamora, and Nebula crash lands, and the two start fighting. I loved this whole sequence. God, it was, yeah. it was so good. It really just speaks to my most primary values, and uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. I love when Gamora freaking just picks up the, yeah, giant, the giant blaster from yes. the ship, like just carrying it on her <laughs> shoulder shooting. like it's, it's nothing. So and just, it's so and good. Nebula sees it and is like, "Oh god, I gotta get out of the no, ship." No, 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 no. Seatbelt, seatbelt. So in the fight, Nebula seems to be coming out on top and talks about how she just wanted a sister, recalling Thanos mutilating her every time she lost against Gamora, replacing her parts with mechanical ones to make her better. In the comics and the Infinity Gauntlet specifically, Nebula pretended to be the granddaughter of Thanos, and when he found out, he tortured her, wreaking havoc on her body and presented her to Death, whom Thanos is in love with, in an attempt to impress her. No time, but I thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, (laughs) we should definitely read Infinity Gauntlet. Yeah, that would be really fun. We should, yeah, that would be really good. We should. The two put aside their fighting when they find a cavern filled with skeletons. So many yep. bones. So, Lots of bones. So many. All yeah. the many bones. You don't want to find that. Mm-mm. It's not what you want. Mm-mm. No. It's not and I love Saturday. that there are so many, you know, recognizably non-human skulls yeah. contained within the cavern of bones, including a skull that looks an awful lot like Beta Ray Bill. Ooh, I did not catch that. Yeah, I, I that need to watch it again. Fun. I haven't confirmed that. I mean, not that, felt... I, not that it's Beta Ray Bill, but no, no, maybe no. someone from his race. Yes. And a tease for Beta Ray Bill, please. Thank you, MCU. Yes. <laughs> Beta Ray Bill would be lots of fun. Beta Ray Bill, Sarah, is a horse-faced alien who for a while was Thor. Yep. 
I knew that somehow. I think we maybe then, talked about that before. Okay, yeah. all right. And then Odin made him his own hammer. Yeah. So he could continue being Thor. Oh, he gets a, a horsey Mjolnir. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a Mew Mew. <laughs> a horsey Mew Mew. Uh, a horsey Mew Mew. That would, that would be like the horse on the stick, except in power with the power of gods, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Star Lord and Ego continue the bond, and we learn that as long as there is light on this planet, Star Lord will have powers and be immortal, mm -hmm. like his father. Which explains how he was able to hold on to the power gem in the first film yes. and not be destroyed. Yeah. Also the power of friendship, but... Also yeah, the power a of friendship. A little bit of both. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he would have been destroyed, but not as quickly. And yeah. then yeah. his friends helped him. <laughs> they give him that like yeah. extra 1%. Yep. <laughs> I like it. Mantis wakes up Drax to inform him of Ego's true plans. Mm -hmm. Back with Yondu, Yondu goes off on Rocket's tough guy image, telling him that they are just alike, acting out of fear and hurt. And I really like that moment. Yeah. This is one, uh, gosh, okay, I think that I teared up during this moment because whenever, you know, Yondu is yelling at him and just saying stuff like, oh yeah, you know, you're pushing everybody away and blah, 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 and all this and that and the other, and it turns out that, like, Yondu is also talking to Slash about himself, and yeah. just, like, yeah. for these two characters to bond over this very specific thing, like, it hurt my heart so much. Yeah. I was just like, you guys just want to be loved. It was really, really good, and, and really did, I think, deliver mm -hmm. on the buildup that we've got for Rocket's character through mm -hmm. the first half of the movie, yeah? Right, for sure. And it even touched on Rocket's origins of his him being created, yeah. Yeah. and I really like that as, yeah. as well. Uh, back with Ego, Ego talks to Star-Lord about his plan that he calls the Expansion, how he planted those alien plants on thousands of other worlds to extend himself to those planets. He impregnated women from those worlds and produced many children that Yondu delivered to him, but when they did not possess the same power of a celestial, Ego killed them, and that their bones are the ones that Gamora and Nebula found. This is... Like, as far as, like, villainous plans go, yeah. this one is pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. This is pretty extreme. I mean, like, I was legitimately shocked and terrified and just, like, pissed off. Right. Like, just angry that yeah. this was a thing that he had done. You go, it turns out, is a pretty great antagonist. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He, yes. he works really quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During this time when Star-Lord mm -hmm. is all starry-eyed in a trance, he says, I can see it, Eternity, which may be a reference to the comics character Eternity, which is basically the character that all of the universe is contained inside of. He's just a big silhouette in a big white mm -hmm. space with the universe inside of him at no time, but that's a big Marvel character. It shows up often in Doctor Strange. This is, yeah, one of the Kirbyest characters in all so it's like of the, the end MCU. of St. Elmo's fire like it's all inside of eternity <laughs> <laughs> kind of <laughs> <laughs> So turns out Star Lord does have this power. As we saw, mm -hmm. he had he had the ball, and he can help Ego to fulfill his plan. Yeah. The Ego needs the offspring to give him the extra boost and power to be able to do what he needs to do. Then Ego reveals that he put the tumor in Star Lord's mom's head to free himself of the pain of leaving her. That that's not. That's I mean, as far uh, yeah. as breakup what? plans go, again, just very bad, very yeah. terrible. Also, okay, so are there no other Celestials that like? Ego could go and find and do this whole thing with, or I'm does he not require sure. an offspring so that he can control that offspring? I, there's some language in the yeah. movie about the, yeah, the degree to which an offspring would be, you know, compatible with ego, right. compatible mm -hmm. with his yeah. powers. I don't think that another celestial would necessarily work. Okay. Right. From what we've seen so far in MCU, we've only had a couple of small glimpses of what celestials all are, and they're all different seeming. Yeah. So who else have we seen? We saw a celestial uh, skull floating in space. That yeah. was nowhere in the oh, first okay. one. And then in the footage, when they were talking about the power gem and they showed the giant creature destroying things, that was a celestial. Oh. Um, I think those are the only two. I can't Those are the only of, two that yeah. remind me. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we didn't do one like a Doctor comics, Strange or anything? No. Okay. In the comics, uh, Ego is not a celestial. Yeah. So this is kind of new territory. Okay. I'm not sure All where right. we're going to be going with sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. It does seem as though celestial might not be a descriptor of a race as much as it's a descriptor of like a power level. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh. if you are god -like just being. yeah, godlike beings. Okay. Okay. So all they're right. not necessarily all the same. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. 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 Yeah. And when Ego reveals that he did this to Star Lord's mom, Star Lord snaps out of his starry eyed trance and just shoots the hell out of Ego. And yeah. it is my favorite scene it maybe in this whole so film. Good. When he just goes, what? And just pulls his guns and just unloads. He's like, yeah. you were not my yeah. father and you were dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it's, without hesitation. You shouldn't have killed my mom and squished my Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. But it turns out Ego doesn't need Star-Lord's willing cooperation. He just needs him there mm -hmm. to use his power. Mm -hmm. 
So he restrains him and uses his extra power, activating the plants on all of these planets, causing mass destruction. And Ego crushes Star-Lord's Walk- Walkman and the awesome mixtape volume two that his mother left him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you get to see uh, when they're flashing the different plants as the plants grow in these big blobs and start destroying things. Mm-hmm. You see Star-Lord's grandpa from the first film on Earth uh, in a car for a, a brief second. And then in another brief second, you see two older people filming it. Th- those are uh, James Gunn's parents. Nice. <laughs> oh, cute. <laughs> so, yay. Hey, Mom and Dad. Some Come be destroyed by there. this alien thing. <laughs> Rocket, Groot, Yondu, Gamora, Drax, Nebula, and Mantis all join up and gear up to stop Ego. Yeah, this is our transition into the climax of the movie. The That's Guardians right. are, are reunited. Mm-hmm. We kind of have laid to rest each of the subplots. We'll, we'll put a button on each of those yeah. right at the end of the movie, but this works for me really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were you guys worried at all that we were going to end up with another giant, uh, huge uh, power laser beam shooting up into the sky and being surrounded <laughs> by a whole lot of, like, just numerous, <laughs> numerous uh, little villains that we then had to destroy, like... The last, I don't know, six Marvel films. <laughs> it's a lot of summer blockbusters yeah. that do yeah. that. I'm <laughs> always now worried about that. Yeah, yes. and yeah. that's just my, I, I, that's my fear. That's my greatest fear, <laughs> is that every film will somehow have that. I do like the, I, I think it's right around here where Yandu is accepted as the Guardians. Groot accepts him yeah. specifically mm-hmm. using the F word, but for yeah. some reason yes. Rocket decides to not use it. <laughs> it says, we got to talk about your language later. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where we get um, Star-Lord saying, you look like Mary Poppins. And Yandu says, is he cool? <laughs> So it says, hell yeah, he's cool. And the other says, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. Which was... Ringtone, please. Michael was, Rooker saying, right? I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. God, it's that was one good. of the greatest jokes I've ever witnessed. It was and it made me so, so, so happy. I loved it. Because he's yeah. floating down with his little yes. arrow. Also such like a comic umbrella. book thing. Yeah. For, for a character, for his existing power set to be used in a new way, mm-hmm. for right. the, the arrow now to basically grant Yondu the ability to fly is yes. just great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Star-Lord fights Ego's human form, but his entire planet self fights back. Mm -hmm. Mantis is able to put Ego to sleep for a little bit while the Guardians fight back against the Sovereigns who showed up with all of their ships to Mm -hmm. attack as well. Yeah. (laughs) Every time the Sovereign showed up and we saw that they were like in their neat little like arcade pods like back on their planet and doing things, it just made me want to watch Ender's Game again. Yeah. (laughs) And they made a lot of arcade jokes while they were doing it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, But their whole fleet's destroyed. They used the giant lasers on the ship that... uh, they they took from the Ravagers yes. it's a construction ship so it's made to cut through rock and mm-hmm. they were trying to cut into Ego's planet uh, to get to the core but they couldn't use it quite to do that because the fleet interrupted mm-hmm. them that that laser effect on the construction ship is fantastic. Yeah, it's the way yes. the little yeah. laser little projectors move, move around. around. It was yes. really fun. so good. Yes. Yeah, I love very that. well thought out. Yeah. I think Rocket builds a bomb using the batteries that he stole, and Groot <laughs> takes it and runs off with it because he is small enough to take it to Ego's through Ego's thick defenses and then to the core to the yeah. blow up the brain. This was a joke that absolutely, enti- I mean, like, we probably spend too long on the does anyone have any tape yeah. thing. And, and we saw it in every trailer, too. I don't yeah. even care. But it's still funny. I don't even yeah. care. It was, like, that kind of thing was specifically made to delight me because yeah. you just hear Rocket yelling at everybody, like, Gamora, do you have any tape? No? Okay, all right, all right, okay, you're cool. All right, hey, Quill, Quill, do you have- And I just... God, I was losing it. I could not even. It was, and then, and I literally could not the even. The part in the trailer that, uh, that we didn't see in the trailer, but we saw in the film that I really liked is like, I don't remember. Is he saying, did you ask Nebula? And did you ask Nebula? Nebula? Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, he, she was right next to him. But, like, but you didn't ask her? <laughs> but you ask her? <laughs> she was right next to him. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if this is like. Had tape, it would be you. I feel like this is every conversation that every sibling has had with one of their siblings yes. at some point. Yeah. And they're like, hey, go get that thing for me. They, well, did you ask them if they had? Why would they ask them? They were right next to him. <laughs> It really works. And here we get a really interesting kind of reflection on the story that has been told about Peter Quill all the way through the movie, because Groot actually is small enough that he can sneak into places. Right. Yes. And yeah. I don't know if that, when I watch the movie again, I'm going to be paying close attention to that because I don't know if that builds into something, but it's damn near a three I beat I feel like there point. is like a three beat there. I yeah. Like yeah. It. yeah. Mm-hmm. So as we mentioned with that part in the trailer, Rocket warns Groot not to push the wrong button or they'll all die, but he doesn't seem to get it, but runs off anyways. <laughs> Mantis gets knocked out, which awakens Ego, who starts to swallow up the Guardians as they try to escape. Mm-hmm. Which is a little frightening, especially when they show uh, Groot yes, getting... Yeah, uh, yeah, my claustrophobia no, uh, really uh, got yeah, hit right there. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. As Yondu goes down, he reminds Star-Lord that he doesn't control his arrow with his head, uh, which is a conversation they had earlier when mm-hmm. he was talking about playing catch with the, with the powered ball. Yeah. And... Now Star-Lord realizes that the only way to overpower Ego is to control the celestial powers with his heart. Mm-hmm. 
Break the Chain begins to play as <laughs> Star-Lord <laughs> thinks about his mom and we all sob, right? <laughs> Yep. Right? It yep. really got yeah. me right there. No, I was, was like, oh my yeah. gosh. Yes, no, it's it's a really excellent <laughs> sequence. Um, they do turn into Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort from the end of uh, Deathly Hallows Part 2. Uh, but it's cool. I'm into it. Like, I like but, the effect. I think that it's good. But, no, but they don't was... stay there because he becomes Pac-Man. Too. Right, exactly. Yes. Yes, he yes. Becomes... I'm going to be making some weird shit. Yeah. Uh... Yes. <laughs> well, yeah he, he totally referenced that he would be yeah. doing this if yes, he had these yes, powers. Exactly. So it's not out of the blue. And I really, mm-hmm. I think it worked for yeah. me a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Guardian's are freed from Ego's grasp and Groot reaches Ego's brain in the planet's core, setting the bomb to go off in five minutes. Drax carries Mantis to the ship while Gamora and Nebula also make it to the ship. Rocket gives his last spacesuit to Yondu to save Star-Lord, but he only has one. Mm -hmm. Gamora tries to go back, but Rocket knocks her out, saying he's not willing to lose another friend. And that's a really sweet moment to me. And yeah, that's that's like, oh man. That's about whenever I start really losing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whenever, when you get to the point um, in any story, wherever you've got like your intrepid heroes, but we're still missing one person and somebody is like, no, I can't, you know, I, you know, we can't, we have to go or we're all going to like, I just, uh, I'm such a sucker for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Ego pleads with Star-Lord to stop the bomb or else Star-Lord will be just a normal human to which Star-Lord replies that he sees nothing wrong with that and lets the bomb go off. Mm -hmm. Ego's human form disintegrates as the rest of the planet starts to explode. Yondu swoops in, grabbing Star-Lord. As they leave the planet's atmosphere, Yondu puts the suit on Star-Lord to save him and tells him that while Ego was his father, he was never his daddy. And Yondu then starts to freeze up in space. I... This, this is it. I mean, this is this is the adamantium bullet that will yeah. pierce mm-hmm. my armor because the sacrifice here is just yeah. stunning. I didn't know where to put up my notes because I couldn't remember exactly when it happened. But uh, we did learn previously that Yondu had saved Star-Lord when he realized what it was that Ego was doing yeah. to these yeah. children. Mm-hmm. Um, Which so, connects all the way back to the start of the movie. This is why yeah. Yondu is exiled from the Ravagers. Is yes. because, well, it's partly because he, he was trafficking in children in the first right. place, but mm-hmm. also because he isn't following through on his mission. This is why the mutiny yes. occurs. Yes. This whole whole thing we learn incontrovertibly that yondu cares for quill as though he were his yeah. father he was willing it's to fantastic. do all of these things yeah. for star lord that he was willing to lose his ship and lose yeah. his crew and then die for yeah. him <laughs> retroactively makes the first movie make so much more sense yeah. because yeah. yondu's motivation through that movie was always weird yeah. yeah but i love this that he will do whatever he has to do to to for his support kid. his family his well son. in the first instance yeah. to keep his, to keep the ravagers together mm-hmm. to keep his crew yeah. together but he won't cross this line yeah that's right. fantastic yeah and uh yeah whenever you've got peter quill yelling no 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 you can't do this you can't do this and like getting teary-eyed and then i completely lose my mind and guys, i can't yeah. even handle it chris pratt's really good he's oh, yeah. really good he's yeah. really good yeah the yeah. emotion here is way too much for me yeah <laughs> like especially coming right off of that moment where he confronts ego and then to this where he finds who his daddy is yeah <laughs> he's like you took care of me and you like his heart connects in that moment and he realizes just when it's too late to ever to yeah. reciprocate well, and it and the whole idea I mean yeah the whole idea that like okay that man was your father but he was never your daddy that speaks like very very much to me personally sure. like having like a really crappy parent it's like well yeah you know that's your biological parental unit but like it's not your mom it's not your yeah. dad it's not yeah. the people who cared for you and raised you and, exactly. and all of that and so yeah that just oh god yeah adamantium bullet like straight to my heart and just <laughs> yeah. I'm ruined forever so the Guardians start to give Yondu a proper Ravager funeral, calling back to when um, he was told previously by his yeah. old commander that he would not give an, be given an honorable funeral yeah. for the yeah. things that he had Which done. Which is apparently such an important part of Ravager culture that it, it all but destroys Yondu when he hears this. Yeah. This yeah. is as bad as the exile. Yes. This, mm-hmm. is, this is as bad as Worse it Worse than the exile, yeah. maybe. Yeah. 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 And Kragling gives Peter a Zoom to make up for his lost Walkman, <laughs> which he says that Yondu had been holding on to, meaning to give to him for a while. And in return, Peter gives uh, Kragling Yondu's arrow, feeling that Yondu would want him to take it. So they have this like little sibling bonding moment, like they, they were mm-hmm. both children of Yondu. Yeah. yeah. And uh, these are the things left for this them. This is such a good joke. The Zoom joke is yeah. perfect. <laughs> yes, Everyone's listening really to is. it now. It, it could have been an iPod and it would have been fine. Like it still would have been but funny. But it's better than it's a Zoom. But it's a Zoom. Yeah. It's, yes. Thank yes. you, yes. Yeah. Thank you, James Gunn. You did that just right? for me. It yes. feels like. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, Children of Yondu is an amazing punk band name <laughs> that is does only uh, okay. MCU yeah. songs. Uh, wait, so, uh, which instruments are we playing? Yeah. Let's do this. Uh, I can do the triangle. <laughs> okay, good. good. I'll, I'll play bass. L- a lot of triangle, a lot of maracas. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. uh-huh. Well, I think I this can... leaves you singing, Sarah. Well, well, I mean, okay, I can maybe. No, you do... can be our Kim Pine drummer. I can be the Kim Pine drummer there and also yeah, yeah. lyrics. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. And I'll do some singing and bass. Perfect. 
Yep, I've, great. I've done both of those things in podcast Nailed very it. often. So. Show me what you do. Patreon.com slash radio. That's a three beat, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nebula reconciles with Gamora and leaves to hunt down Thanos. Mantis decides to stay. I really like that stay. scene too. Sorry. Yeah, it's yeah, a, really, yeah, 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 it's, no. it's a, it's a yeah. really good one. Yeah, it was like, great. Yeah. There are so many little girls out in the world who need to be saved. And Nebula's like, I will save them by killing him. Yes. And I'm like, I'm into that. I was really into that line. Yeah. I totally, when I was making notes, thing. I forgot about that. But that was yeah. such yeah. a great moment yeah. when she mm-hmm. said that. Yeah. This is how I will save other girls. Yes. And I was like, oh, that's so good. Uh, Mantis does decide to stay with the Guardian. So we will probably mm-hmm. see more of her mm-hmm. in upcoming films. And as Yondu's body goes out into space, the Guardians see dozens of Ravager ships, including Stakar, arriving to pay their respects to Yondu, having heard of how he saved the galaxy and sacrificed himself. Mm-hmm. And we get these brief shots of the crews of the different Ravager ships, and yes. we get to see how diverse yeah. these people actually mm-hmm. are. Pretty great. Yeah. So, I'll- okay, what is up with the Ravagers? Like... What space pirates? Spa- okay, no. just space yeah. pirates. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I don't know. If Clans actually... of space pirates. I, I yeah. think the Various idea is that they, they of have. Space yeah, I think so. There's a clan culture there. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool, cool, cool. Also, there's a small Easter egg. You will notice that there's various trinkets on Yondu's body as they're about to send them out. One of them is the little blue crystal frog that he yes. pointed out from the first movie and was like, "How much is this guy? I have. A, I like to put him on my dash." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, that little frog is there. Notice that. That's excellent. <laughs> So that brings us to the end of our film. The credits start and we see a couple of small cameos in these bubbles dancing. It's really great graphics in the credits. I, I love, love the graphics. I love these credits. Probably these my favorite the... of any credits oh, I've yeah. seen. No, they're amazing credits. Wow. That's yeah, up there. Up it's there. Definitely. really well yeah, designed. It's like, really, really well thought aesthetic. through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you want me to read your credits, this is the way to yes. do it. Yes, uh, so, Sometimes the credits say, uh, I am Groot, and then yeah. switch over to saying the actual <laughs> yes. credit words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I love, I mean, like, it's just got that whole, like, this is your dad's, like, vinyl record collection. Yeah, exactly. This is the yeah. back of all of these vinyls that yeah, are, right. like, touch Coupled away. with that, like, 70s aesthetic for, like, record sales on, yes. on TV, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. like, TV commercials. Yeah, and they show some, like, trading card looking things. Yes, 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 yes. But a couple of those uh, dancing bubbles, we see uh, Cosmo the Space Dog, which yep. is a big character mm-hmm. from the comics, and he did make a small cameo in the first film. I was hoping he'd be more in this film, yep. but that's okay. Yep. Yep. And we saw Jeff Goldblum's Grandmaster from Thor Ragnarok dancing in one of those bubbles. Yes. In the comics, he's the brother of the Collector from the first Guardians film, so I, I kind of wonder if yeah. they're going to make that connection in the films. Okay. We're slowly but surely just tying the Thor universe, or the Thor slice of the MCU, and the Guardian slice of the MCU. Yeah. Into very well, closely together. To be fair, yeah. most of like the origins of the things that we've seen in Guardians started in Thor. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of connection there with uh, Cosmic Marvel and Thor. Yeah, it's true. When we think of Cosmic, we generally think of Kirby and Stanley doing Fantastic Four in the early 60s, but there's a lot of this stuff comes in yeah. with Simonson and Thor in, in up to the 1980s, yeah. So we have five actual uh, credit scenes here mm-hmm. after credit scenes. There were scenes. a lot. There were so many. That's like the most <laughs> yeah, that is a lot. to this yeah. and day, right? I love it. The more of this, please. Because <laughs> this is how you get me to stay through your credits. And I really like interspersing them throughout the credits. Just, yes. Here's another one. Wait a little bit. Here's another one. Wait a little bit. Here's another one. Rather than just having to wait through the credits, I'm on my phone chilling out. Yeah. You're keeping me active. You're keeping me focused right, in reading right. these credits. Tweeting about the movie. And some of them are saying I am Groot. So I'm literally reading these credits. <laughs> yes. Fantastic job. This, no one has ever made me read credits yeah. so much. Uh, so our very first one is just Craglin trying to practice using this arrow, obviously controlling it with his head because he is, doesn't know what he's doing. Yep. Yep. And he shoots it right in the Drax. <laughs> and it's like, oh, and then kind of walks away. It's a real fun, like, yes. Tunes type joke. I love it. The next one shows Stakar honoring uh, Yandu's sacrifice by forming his own team uh, with Martinex Tanaga. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce any of these right because I've only ever Sounds read good. them. Yep. Who's played by Michael Rosenbaum, who played Lex Luthor in Smallville. Sure. Charlie 27, Starhawk, and Mainframe. And Mainframe is voiced by Miley Cyrus. So, what? <laughs> yeah, which I guess uh, Gunn said that he really liked working with Miley Cyrus. So maybe you'll see more of that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, anyways. But here is the original team of the Guardians of the Galaxy from the 60s, excluding Yondu, who was one of their number in the comics. Um, The team first appeared in a partial reprint of a Marvel superheroes issue number 18 in 1969, written by Arnold Drake and penciled by Gene Colan. They are from the 31st century, but they've often come to the 20th century Mm -hmm. before. So the team would have... uh, the team we have in this film is from the 2008 uh, yeah. Annihilation series that I've mentioned before, and they had some interaction with that team, but mostly that 60s team was forgotten by that point, and yeah. no okay. one really cared much about them. So it's kind of interesting to see the way they're bringing some of this together mm-hmm. here. Um, we also see that the... Uh, 
the red character, Krugar, is harnessing mystical energy like Doctor Strange, if you know this, uh, in that scene. Mm. And that's because he's actually really connected to Doctor Strange. He's a disciple of Doctor Strange and does at one point become the Sorcerer Supreme in the comics. Yeah. So that's th- really interesting. we're tying more things into other things yeah. here that if you know, then you can see the connections. Okay, cool. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. In another end credit scene, <laughs> we have Aisha... Uh, and another sovereign discussing their plan to take down the guardians. We see Aisha sitting by a birthing pod, waiting to break out whatever is inside to use against the guardians. She decides to call it Adam. Mm -hmm. This references Adam Warlock, a genetically perfect, super powerful being designed by a group of scientists to be a more perfect version of of Aisha. Yeah. But here she, he's being created by Aisha. Tying Uh, back to, yeah. In the comics, they're known as him and her. I think they're alternate names. Um, in the comics, he plays a big role in the Infinity Gem arc, mm-hmm. and he was referenced in the first film by a cocoon, but Gunn said that was just supposed to be a throwaway joke, mm-hmm. and it should now be dismissed and ignored. <laughs> oh, okay. Because this is clearly not a throwaway joke. Nope, not anymore. Adam Warlock. Okay. Adam Warlock is coming. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> huh. <laughs> this means nothing to me, but I'm excited. <laughs> I'm just I'm just eager to play yeah. along, you guys. <laughs> Adam Warlock is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy and is a pretty big deal in like the 70s Marvel oh, cosmic yeah. comics. Yeah. Uh, not so much modern day, but a little bit in the Annihilation stuff that happened as well. So Even my yeah. husband, who is a DC fanboy and not a super big fan of Marvel, knew who Adam Warlock was. So yeah. I guess he's like a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah, if you're into Marvel Cosmic, yes, absolutely. He's he's extremely powerful. He's extremely capable. The cocoon thing is really interesting. Every time he regenerates in his cocoon, kind of almost Doctor Who style, he emerges with new powers. Huh. So he's a constantly regenerating character. The idea being that he will adapt to overcome whatever it is that he's sure, facing. Yeah. So he's basically infinitely powerful because you can't kill him and he will keep coming back with stuff that you can't anticipate. Oh, boy. So interesting. <laughs> so how are we going to kill him? This is what we're going to find out. Guardians 3 coming yeah. in. I don't know. Whatever. 2019. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that sounds like a good year. 2019, but set at the end of 2014. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Man, we are getting silly with these timelines. So in another scene, we get Groot now being a teenager. So I don't know how much time has passed because it took three months for him to go from being a plant, like a, a potted a plant yeah. seedling thing basically. to baby Groot. And now he's a teenager. I actually read this as evidence that we are going to fast forward the timeline and that years are going to pass yeah. before we get to Infinity War. I, right. think, that I think that makes might a lot of yeah. sense. I think yeah. so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> we have Star-Lord scolding him for leaving his roots around. And we have Groot mocking him with his, I am Groot, sarcastically. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's it was so funny. Yeah. He's just good. playing yeah. video games <laughs> on the ship. I, and I like that this seems to be another uh, calling back to something where now Star Lord is in the place of fatherhood. Yeah. 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 Now I know right? how yeah. Yondu yeah. felt. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> And then finally, we get our final scene with (laughs) Stan Lee in his obligatory cameo here with the Watchers. Once again, the Watchers are apparently bored of his conversations and get up to leave him. And he's like, oh, you guys were my ride. I need. (laughs) okay." Oh, geez. Oh, guys. (laughs) It's pretty cute. I wonder how much of that is meta commentary on viewers of the MCU movies getting a little tired. It's a hundred thousand billion percent. Yes. A (laughs) fulfillion percent. (laughs) And that's Guardians 2. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. We did it. I think we really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Where does it rank for you alongside the other MCU movies? Obviously, we've mm. only seen it once, so we can't yeah. really mm. judge it, but is it like a contender for mm. top five? Is it a yes. contender it's for top three? It's in my top, top five. Maybe? I think it might be in top five, but probably not top three for y- me. Personally. You know what? Hold on. Hold on. Uh oh. Yeah, it has to be pretty close because the first Guardians was in my top three. Ooh. And wow. I think and I think this beat it. Ooh, boy. I think I like this more. Ooh. I don't think th- that's the problem with grading sequels. How can you like the second one more than the first one if it's reliant upon the first one? I don't well, know. But I, mean, but I just I enjoyed it. I enjoyed how. it more. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it more. So yeah, I think it might be two or three on my yeah. list. Wow. wow. Okay. okay. Sarah, I think I'm with you. I think it's probably top five. I certainly like it more than Guardians one, mm-hmm. but yeah, maybe maybe five. It maybe yeah. because I like the more grounded, you know, yes. cap stories mm-hmm. more yeah, than yeah, I like yeah. the cosmic yeah. stuff yeah. still, sure. but. That's where it sits for me, and you're thinking the same? I think so. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate for me. And we're in now for a Guardians Volume 3, which they yeah. will inevitably announce because oh, this movie has they already, already been... announced it. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I missed it. I probably read it on Twitter. And because like, Gunn well, said like multiple times, I am not doing it. This takes too much time. And yeah. then when this came out, he goes, okay, I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> All, right, All right, fine. Back the money truck up to my house. Okay. <laughs> Just dump the gold directly into my pool. <laughs> maybe maybe this time Nathan Fillion's cameo will actually get put in the movie because oh, he's well, shown up for both so. films to film yeah. one and then neither of them made Aww. the cut. <laughs> 
<laughs> we can Sorry, help that. He has to end up in the MCU sooner or later. He is Seriously. too good an actor yes. and too culturally yes. specific. Yes. I do like not he's not getting up. cameos because I mean he could actually be a big character yeah. sometime yeah. down the line. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to see him in Spider-Man Homecoming. Or yeah. the sequels to that. <laughs> there are lots of Spider-Man characters that he could play, actually. I would be super into that. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I don't know that we're definitely getting a J. Jonah Jameson in Spider-Man Homecoming. I mean, Ooh. I feel as though we kind of should. But I, I could see. Know. I don't know. It's still J.K. Simmons for me. That's still the oh, yeah. take on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good. So good. Then I think we'll do it for our discussion of Guardians. I think so. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed this show, if you want to support us and help us do more stuff like this, head on over to patreon.com slash common room radio where you can kick us a dollar a month or whatever you can afford. You can also find us on Twitter. We are at Excelsior Cast. You can find me personally at Elsa Grab the Salt. I'm at Paper Bullets. I'm at Fleshy there. And you can hear more from me on the Graphic Media Podcast Network and my podcast, the Read Brave Comics Podcast, which we had Sarah on a couple I- weeks ago Yay! and i got the interview with the creator, co-creator of lumberjanes yeah which was awesome yeah, yeah yeah you're living your best life now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay uh what are we doing next time then? so next time we will be talking about jeff lemire's uh first volume of his comic black hammer mm-hmm. this is a comic that references heavily heavily the uh golden age of comics basically taking heroes from there like shazam captain america uh swamp creatures and uh <laughs> horror witch ladies and sci-fi tropes and what? putting them into this small town where they've lived for 10 years trapped, not sure what to do with themselves or how to get out. Huh. I am into that. That sounds amazing. Yes. So it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds really great. of Black Hammer, that's next week on yes. Excelsior. That sounds great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time. I'm Sarah K. Bazant. I'm Alistair Stevens. And I'm Mary Poppins, y'all! <laughs> Excelsior! Excelsior!